Welcome back, Room 19. We are looking at Woods Runner, Chapter 2, author Gary Paulson. Let's dig into it. Samuel has returned home from the forest the night before and found his parents sipping tea with Isaac, an old man of the forest who stopped by their cabin every few months while he was hunting. This time, though, he had news. He carried information about a fight in Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. These are super important cities. Where militia had fired and fired on and defeated British soldiers. The battle had happened months before. If you guys remember on the previous page, we talked about how slow news comes. So months ago, this begins. All the way back in April of 1775. Isaac seemed to be made entirely of scraps of old leather and rags. He was bald and wore a ratty cap with patches of fur that had been worn away. He was tall and thin and for many years had lived in a cabin some 20 miles to the east. He was so much a part of the forest that even his brief visits with Samuel's family caused him discomfort. He decided to move farther into the frontier when a wagon pulled by oxen came into the clearing near his cabin. His family was traveling westward looking for a piece of land to farm and had chosen a spot not far from Isaac's place. The family was, Isaac said, a crowd and knew it was time to move on seeing as how I don't do particular good with crowds of people. As he was taking his leave from the small shack where he had lived, the family had given him the scrap of paper soft with wear from all the hands that had passed through so he could share the news with fellow travelers he met on his journey. They told him of the other events they had heard of along the way. He tried to remember the details, but admitted that he wasn't much for conversation. Since there was so much, since there was so much noise from the sprats, as it seemed a dozen of them, my thinker fuzzed up like bad powder, and my recollector might not be all it could be. But I think they said there, were, there was another fight at a place called Bunker Hill. And the Patriot militia got whipped there and sent running when they saw the bayonets on the British soldiers' muskets. He sat quietly sipping the evergreen tea he had always carried, a brew made from pine and spruce needles. He swore it cured colds, and he said he preferred it over burnier tea from outside. But thank you, Mrs. Ooh, uh, that pine needle tea full of vitamin C, really good for you. The paper he'd handed to Samuel's father, Owen, was a single sheet that had been folded and unfolded so many times it, it was near to falling apart. It had been printed on a crude press with wooden block letters and was smudged and hard to read. But there was a brief description of the fight at Lexington and Concord and a drawing of figures firing muskets at some other figures that were falling into the ground. As Samuel studied the paper his father handed hands, he thought, everything in my world just got bigger. Two other families, the Clarks and the Overtons, pulled up their wagon. Isaac had spoken to them on his way to Samuel's place, and they wanted to hear what Olwen had to say about Isaac's news. Samuel looked around the small cabin on the edge of the woods that was suddenly filled with people all talking over each other about the meaning of the battles. It seemed that the strong and sturdy log walls no longer protected his family. The loud outside world his parents had escaped by, moving to the frontier had found them. Samuel was excited and frightened and overwhelmed all at the same time. But what does it mean? Ebenezer Clark asked Olin. His face was red and round as an apple because he drank home beer three quarts every morning for breakfast. It could be local, just some trouble in Boston, Samuel's father said. A riot or the like. There's always a chance of rabble rousing in the cities. And it doesn't seem likely that a group of farmers would try to take on the entire British army. He paused, then added thoughtfully, England has the most powerful army and navy in the world. And a gaggle of farmers would have to be insane to fight them. Likely or not, 
This from Lund Harris, a soft-spoken and careful man whose wife Clara sat nursing an infant. If it happens, we have to think what it means for us out here on the edge. Nobody spoke. Samuel could hear the crackle of the fire in the fireplace. fireplace. In the homey safe cabin, the craziness of the information from the east seemed impossible. There was always some measure of violence on the frontier. Marauding savages, drunks, thieves, evildoers, men who operated outside the walls of reason. Harshness was to be expected in the wild. But nothing like this, nothing like nothing that challenged the established order, the very rule of the crown, the civilized life that came from England, the English way of living. The very idea of fighting the British was too big to understand too huge to even contemplate or think about. These settlers had always been loyal to the rules of the land, obedient to the laws of the country that ruled them. Ben Overton stood. He was a tall, thin man whose sleeves had never seemed to come to his wrists. He said, well, I think we should do nothing but wait and see how the wind blows. And with nods and a few mumbles of affirmation, the rest got up and went back to their own homes. Not a single person in the cabin could have known what was coming. And even if they had seen the future, they would not have been able to imagine the horror. All right, we've got some more nonfiction. And today, Mr. Paulson's got a piece of uh, fic nonfiction called Frontier Life. So more information we'll need to understand the story. The only thing that came easy to people of the frontier was land. A single family could own hundreds, even thousands of acres simply by claiming them. If getting the land was easily accomplished, using the land was a different matter. It had to be cleared of trees for farming. Some oaks were five or six feet in diameter and each had to be chopped down by ax, cut into manageable sections and hauled off. Then the stump was dug out of the ground, would often, often with a handmade wooden shovel. One stump might take a week or two of hard work, and a piece of land could have ten, tens of dozens of trees. If family was lucky, they might find a clearing left by beavers, which logged off an area and dam a creek to make a lake, rotting out all the stumps. When the trees and the food are gone, the beavers leave, the dam breaks down, the water drains off and there's a handy clearing left where the lake was. All right, so you can either do the work of removing the trees yourself or count on those beavers. All right, that was chapter two.